I'm good. <laughs>
welcome to those of us who uh, are joining us through our live stream today as well. Uh, Steven is a Yamaha artist and one of our Fluke World Collective members. Um, a little bit about Stephen, uh, he is from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, he studied at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland uh, and the Royal Northern College of Music in Switzerland and America with Sir James Galway. Um, Stephen is also a recipient of the Sir James Galway Rising Star Award. Uh, he currently is performing internationally and giving master classes internationally. Uh, per year he does like over 150 performances, so it is really awesome. Uh, Stephen's recently released two solo albums and uh, also done several recordings uh, through the years with uh, Classic FM and is also the author of uh, Flute Gym, a uh, manual for uh, advanced flute players. She's perfectly placed. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> close to um, So we'll start out with a performance by Stephen and uh, then our master class performers and then after the master class uh, we'll have a short reception for Stephen. Thanks so much. Take it over. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. Would you guys, would you rather sit here in the end of I'm going to play a few pieces of music that we record here. Uh, oh, you're sure? Okay. It's a bit weird, but we'll go with it. <laughs> it's really nice to be here. Um, about, it was at NFA convention in August last year. I was there for one day. I arrived, played my concert, and left really quickly. Do you know what this music sound is so thin? Like, I'm just going to leave it at this height. I was going to put it a little lower, but I know if I try and put it lower, disaster will happen. <laughs> but I was at the NFA convention and I um, went to the Flute World booth because Flute World were the US distributors of my booth. And I was like, I wonder if my book has sold out. This is what I was thinking. So I went to the Flute World booth and I literally like just stepped across the threshold and this crazy guy who is Mark Wallace, by the way, <laughs> I didn't know that Mark is like the boss of Flute World, came running up to me and went, hey, we have to work together. Like, who are you? <laughs> it was a very strange moment. But I immediately thought, he is just the coolest guy. He has such great energy. And I thought, we have to work together. So as a musician, you guys, I'm sure, will understand this. You hear so many things all the time. Hey, you should do this. Let's do this together. But none of them ever actually work out. But this one did. Immediately, I get these emails and messages from him trying to set up this, this um, collective thing. So I had no idea what I was joining. But I said, yes, so let's give it a go. And it has just been a blast, essentially. Flute World let me do a class once a month. I can do it on whatever I like, whatever I think is important. We've done them on Bach sonatas. We've done it on French repertoire. We've done it on Texas Allstate Etude Preparation. We've done it on Mozart concertos for editions. Um, but this is the very, very first time we've done it live in the Charlotte store. So this is really cool. I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you to Flute World for letting me do it. Let me grab a flute. My flute, I believe. So I thought before the class I'd maybe play a couple of things for you. Um, and I always find when I'm playing to an audience of flute players, I have to treat them slightly differently to an audience, like a normal audience, if you like. So I have to ask this question. Is anyone here not a flute player? I, I assume so. One person's not a flute player. Okay. I play an Indian flute. You're learning flute? Yeah, I'm, I know Indian flute. Oh, Indian flute. Wow, that's cool. So you are a flute player. You probably know more than we do about a lot of things. Great. So I try and find pieces when I'm playing to flute players. Don't panic about the length of this. It's actually very short. It's just a lot of, <laughs> just, it's just a lot of stuff on the page. Um, I try and find pieces that maybe flute players don't know, but should know. Um, so I'm going to play two things for you, if I can get this to balance. And these are pieces that um, I don't think are played anywhere near as much as they should be. I, I now live in the US. Actually, I'm starting a new job in August as the professor of flute at Northwestern State University. So this is a real change my life having spent the last 15, 16 years just playing full time. Um, and of course when you play full time, you're either there as a soloist in front of an orchestra, or you're there in an orchestra, or you're there with your piano player, your, your friend who plays piano. I never had to play on a complete repertoire in my kind of professional playing life. It's just never really required, not very often. But now in the US, you guys love an accompanied repertoire. I think there's such a shortage of piano players here as well, that everyone should play unaccompanied all the time. So over the last year, I've really kind of tried to explore some unaccompanied pieces. So I'll play two of them for you. This first one is called Circumambulation, and it's by a composer called Jan Mares. And I was like, what a weird name. So I did a little research. And Circumambulation is not actually a made up word. It's a real thing. And it's kind of a religious thing. So if you can imagine like Hinduism or Buddhism in particular, sometimes, and I mean, I'm speaking from a very ignorant perspective here, but sometimes you'll see these people kind of in this moment of meditation, but what they do is they, they like march around and around. So 
some kind of idol or religious object or artifact or something like this. At least this is what the composer tells me. Um, and this is this walking that kind of never seems to end and you're not quite sure what's going on, this is the act of circumambulation. So this is the inspiration of this piece. Um, and I'm going to switch my phone off and play it for you.
So, so I think it's quite a quirky piece. By the way, I should probably remember to say the two pieces I'm playing, and I think all the pieces that we'll do in the class are available here as well. The world are amazingly organized and made sure these are all available for you. So I don't think this piece, Circumambulation, has been played many, many times. Um, so if you're looking for something at college or, um, or something for fun and want to torch yourself slightly, <laughs> go for it. Let me get these out of the way. So I'm going to play a little piece for you now, which is by a Polish composer called Christoph Zagraja. Zagraja um, has just kind of retired a little bit, not that long ago, but he's a jazz flute player originally. Excuse me. Um, he's a jazz flute player originally and had a huge career in Europe as a jazz flute player. And then towards the end of his kind of performing life, he got involved in flamenco, um, which is the kind of music that originates from Spain and South America and these places, you know, with castanets and all this kind of stuff. Um, so he wrote these pieces, three studies, which are all inspired by flamenco. Um, and they're kind of quirky, they're quite challenging to play. They're called, I think, Three Virtuoso Flamenco Studies, not the most original title in the world, but that's what he's going for. Uh, and the first one is probably the most famous of them all, and uh, I'm going to play it for you now. And the minute I start to play it, you'll realize that there's another composer involved in this that Zagrai has taken huge inspiration from. But I'm not even going to tell you who it is, because you'll laugh probably if I was to tell you. It's just so obvious from the right at the beginning. So here we go. Number one from Zagrai's Three Flamenco, Virtuoso Flamenco.
master class portion is three victim, uh, three students. <laughs> That's a real joke, sorry. Like, so many times do I say that. Uh, there's three people going to play. You guys can choose your own order. So we do rock, paper, scissors. Okay, rock, paper, scissors, here we go. <laughs> we don't have time for rock, paper, scissors. Um, my master classes, I hate the word master class, by the way. I kind of find it uncomfortable. See if you have a question, please just ask it. Don't feel like you have to wait till the very, very end. And the same with you guys. If you want to ask something along the way, please do. These are just my thoughts that I share, and I say this to every single class I ever give. I even say it to my own students that I see on a weekly basis. These are just my ideas. Feel free to ignore them. I give you my word. I will not go home tonight and get into bed and cry myself to sleep because someone did not listen to what I suggested. But what I will say is let's keep an open mind and try some things. There may be some things you don't agree with. There may be some things you've never heard before. There may be things you've heard a thousand times before. So please feel free to get involved, offer your opinion. It's a discussion. Let's go. How are you doing? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Sorry, it's an awkward to do when you're holding a flute. I don't like sitting here. I feel like uncomfortable. I'm going to try and sit in the audience if that's all right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll be playing Syrinx by The Vision. I think you know. Pretty popular. Tell us your name. Oh, I'm Kevin. Kevin, tell us a bit about yourself, like a dating show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm from Bali. Joke here a couple hours. Um, I'm currently in high school right now. I'm a rising 11th grader right now. Been playing flute since sixth grade, so I've been playing about four or five years now. Do you know the story of Serene? Um, I do, but I can't really tell it that well. Tell the badly then. <laughs> Go on. I'll try my best. Um, from what I've heard, I haven't really gone into it much, but pretty much a few. I don't really know. Guys, I don't really know what they're called. But it's pretty much two people kind of so chasing boy. each other. I don't know exactly what it is. Off the top of my head. But two people chase each other. It's about this. Story. Who was who? Who is Serene by first of all? Um. There's two characters in this story. I know, one of them is like a kind of goat. Yeah, and his name? I have no idea. Pan. Pan, Pan. Yes. Yeah, you'll see why he's called Pan second. And the other character? I have no idea. Syrinx. I don't you know. fell into that one. <laughs> I'm going to tell the story, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> yeah, because I feel like your story might not be hugely accurate. Okay, I'm sorry. Who's going to be my timekeeper, by the way? Can you keep the time for me? Thank you, I'll do the story very quick. Okay, so Syrinx, um, excuse me, Pan was half goat, half man. He had the legs of a goat and the waist up into the body of a man. And he had no friends, he was lonely, he was not the nicest guy in the world either. He was looking a bit funny. And he lived up in a cave in the hill, and he really had the hots for this little nymph called Syrinx. He really fancied her, he wanted to take her to Olive Garden and have a nice romantic <laughs> evening for her. And he saw her playing one day on this field below, so he kind of like brushed his fur and stuff, and went down to the field and he said, Hey Syrinx, would you like to go on a date with me? And she took one look at him and was like, oh, absolutely not. And she ran away and this really annoyed Pan. So he chased her and he chased her for quite some time and they went through the meadow. They got to the end of the meadow and then she went into the forest and she could still hear Pan behind her. And she got through the forest and then she came to this river bank and he was fast because he had these little, um, what do you call them, hooves, hooves for feet. And he was catching up to her. So she was standing at the river bank and she was now really panicking about what was about to happen. So in a moment of complete desperation, she magically transformed herself into a clump of reeds, water reeds, sticking out of the riverbank. And then a second later, Pan got through the forest and up to the riverbank, and he looked about and could not see Syrinx anywhere. And he was furious. And in a moment of anger, completely unaware of what he was doing, he snatched up these water reeds. And he went back through the forest, back through the meadow, up the hill, and back to his cave, and he threw these reeds in the corner. He was furious. Anyway, a couple of days later, he calmed down. And he saw these reeds in the corner and he got them and he chopped them into different sizes and bound them together and he made a set of ties called the pan ties. Uh huh, you see? So, this is the story. This is the lament, the first tune that Pan played on his pan pipes in lament of not getting to take Syrinx and Dave. I mean, the truth is, the story is actually really vulgar and like full of terrible things that we're not going to talk about. But that's like the Disney version of the story. <laughs> but this is important. You've got to learn this story. Because if you're going to play this to an audience, you probably need to tell the story. Actually, for years, no, not for years, but for about one season, I used to play this to close the first half of a recital. And then, no, I'm talking absolute rubbish. I would start the second half of it with a recital. The first half would be closed with La Flute de Pan. Okay, you know this sonata for Flute de Pan. And I would tell the story. And then we would take intermission. And then to start the second half, I would play this. And depending on the hall, I would play it in complete pitch blackness or up in a balcony or something. So this is quite a useful piece in terms of programming, but the story is crucial. If you just to walk out and play it, it doesn't have the same effect as if you tell the story and you actually play the story. I think this is a 
at the end of the stage left. That's all I have to tell you. Okay, let's do it. Actually, he, he really goes on and on about it. When I had lessons with him, he never spoke to me about it because my teacher, who had gone to college with him, I kid you not, they were students at the same time, also taught me this. So I kind of went into the Galway class already able to do this. But I have taught it to a lot of people since, and all my friends who have switched to this through him have found this a real deal breaker. So I'm just going to suggest it's up to you whether you want to put in the hard work to change it, and it comes into the right hand thumb. This is by far the most important finger in the entire position of our flute playing. It controls everything from balance to technical work on our fingers and, I kid you not, to the sound that we make. Have you heard about this before? What, well, tell me what people have said about your right hand thumb. Um, they say it sometimes locks on the first. Okay, that's not my problem. My problem actually is that it comes too much under the flute. Mm -hmm. What happens when the thumb is under the flute? But lots of people play like this, but have you ever thought what happens? Well, let's go back to basics. I hate talking about this stuff in master class. I'm sorry, but I want to do it because I know this will really help you. I want to talk about music, but there are three points of balance on the flute. Has anybody not heard about this? Please don't be embarrassed. Three points of balance on the flute. Point number one. Uh, the left side. Or maybe the right Yeah, side. okay, I'll take it. This position here. I don't Any? know about the order of them. But That's okay, you can just come up with one. Specificness, I want specific answers. Another one. Uh, right hand thumb. Right hand thumb, because I just told you that one. That's a good answer. <laughs> and the last one. There you go, the position on your chin. These are the three things that will keep the flute in balance. Now, let's say we take the right hand thumb and we position it underneath the tube, like lots and lots of people do, like Evan is doing a little bit. What is the directional force on the flute? This way. What does that do? What do we then have to do to compensate for that? You know, lock ourselves in. The balance of the flute is very simple. It's this, I have no fingers on. The right hand pushes forward, the left hand pushes towards me, and then it locks in place. Please, can you try and move my foot from my face? It's not going to happen, right? And look, I can do whatever I want. That is totally balanced. Not a single finger on the foot. Totally, totally imbalanced. Try it. I'll hold the end of your foot. That's okay. Is it expensive? Yeah, it is expensive. Okay. <laughs> 
see it's totally in place. Move it quite a bit. No, I mean move your body, not uh -huh. Yeah, it's not going to fall, right? It's totally bounced. And that's because you have a force coming forward from here, which pivots against this left hand and then places it on the foot. Does that make sense if I lost anybody? So how do we get the force going forward with the right hand? Well, we bring the thumb from underneath to behind. If you can bring the thumb behind, you get that directional force. If you watch any really great flute player play, I mean, there are some exceptions to this, but I mean, the majority, their thumb, you probably can't even see it from this direction. Because it's, I know I'm saying I'm a great player, by the way, that sounds incredibly arrogant. But I mean, all my heroes play like this. Go look at pictures and videos and see the thumb comes behind. If you look at my thumb, you probably can't see it so well. Yours is kind of there. So I want you to attend. You don't have to take this away, but I suggest you do. I really do. There's not many things in flute playing that I think there's only one way to do things. I'm very much a player that's like, there's tons of ways to do things, whatever sounds best. This is my one exception. I really do not think there's a better thumb position than this. I've tried, I've explored, I've talked to people, and I think this really changes playing. It takes about two weeks to do, to make the move permanent, which is nothing in the grand scheme of things, but it takes two weeks of torture, maybe a week of torture and a week of figuring it out. So try it. Just bring it back. So it depends on the size of your hand. I recommend you don't keep it that way, but you keep it like that way. Yeah, exactly, because that's going to create a more curve in the right hand thinking as well. Because look at this. If I was to take a picture of a flute catalogue, this is the hand position. Right? Look how good that looks. Does it feel weird? Slightly, yeah. Slightly weird is good. Okay, play me just like a G major scale. Slow. Oh, like a, a hundredth of that. Good. Now, already your head is higher. Okay, but can we put our left foot a little further forward than our right? And then we can stand with our shoulders down and feel like we're a bit prouder to play the flute. And then rather than. Huge difference. Does anyone else agree? Please tell me you agree. I'm not going crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean the difference is huge. So what have we done? Well, first of all, the foot's in balance, which means that the head doesn't have to be part of the balance itself. So the head can be up. We can resonate more from our chest. And then what I also could hear that the angle of airstream was going a little bit too high. It was going a little bit too high because you were turning the head joint out to compensate for this. So as soon as this is up, we can lower the angle of airstream essentially by turning the head joint in a fraction. Does that make sense? Yes. So there's like four, four or five components there to changing everything. <laughs> but, you know, I did this this summer of lockdown. Lockdown in the UK through COVID was really brutal, I think, compared to what you guys had here. We were not allowed to leave our homes for over a year, essentially. It was tough. But I used it to really um, change my embouchure. Because when you were working, when I was doing like 200 concerts a year, I, I had never <laughs> the time to do that. So it suddenly I had like a year off. And I spent about three months really changing the embouchure. And the first time I went back to work, there was a concert, a recital that was moved to an online like recording, you know, when we were doing that. And my um, my friend Ashley and I play lots of concerts together. We decided we wanted to do this version for flipping piano, Paleo Dada Femi Di Zupon. Afternoon of the Fawn, as you guys call it in America. Um, and I listened to it, and I'm really proud of this recording. It's probably the most proud thing I've ever done because I had just changed my own shirt. And I was so scared to play a piece like that, having just changed it. But the control and the color was so much better. And it's really put me on this, like, mission to tell people, you know, if something needs fixed, fix it. Don't wait, fix it. Because, you see, when you get to my age as an old man, time is not easy to find to, to change these things. So this is two weeks' work. That's nothing. You've got this whole summer ahead of you. Okay, so bear that in mind. I know I'll slip in and out at the moment because it's impossible to just change things clearly. But that's your goal. I'm not really too bothered about the piece, if I'm to be honest. That's your goal because you play great. I have no issue with you playing. I just want you to fix that and then not just become a good player, but become an incredible player. Okay, play me just the first note. And I'm listening for the attack at the beginning of it. Again, can you hear the sound in your head that you want before you play it? I can hear you attack it, and it sounds nice actually, for like the first second, and then you hear it, you listen to it, and you're like, okay, that's not what I want, and then you change it. Can you hear it before you start so that the immediate sound we have is exactly what you want? Does that make sense? Cool. Nice. Are you using your tongue? Good. I wouldn't either. Use pip. I use chest. OK. 
Okay, that'll work. Try to. Yeah, you'll need to lift further forward and the angle will move lower than normal. That's a bit too much, okay? There, there it is, okay. Now keep it, and imagine that the air isn't going this way, but it's actually really vibrating down the flip. I kind of think of it like it's spiraling down the tube, so it'd be coming with a little bit of energy at the end. Okay, listen to me back at the beginning. This is just, for me, like having heard strength play 200,000 times badly, this is not a bad version, by the way. This is one of my pet hates, the, the beginning of the first note. If people don't take time to really get the beginning of the first note and the taper at the end of the first line, you've lost the audience before you even get through the first line. So let's make that look really good. Good. Head up, don't cover the whole. Again? Okay. Yes. Again? Okay. Now with a bit more air going down the flute. Okay, let me that first line. Sense. Yes. Your lips have to do that. 
as they come out, we talk about bringing the lips forward constantly, but why do they have to come forward? Because you can't see the teeth. I'm a sim simple guy, I don't need complicated answers. Yeah. This can be the most simple answer. Anyone, why do the lips come forward? Has anyone never heard bring your lips forward? We've all heard someone say, bring your lips forward. Why? What happens when they bring the lips forward? This is not a plug for my book, by the way, but this is why you all need this book, because everything <laughs> is explained in here by your teachers. I don't make any money in this book anymore, just so you know, I sold the distribution rights to the book. But um, it is a good book, and I use it pretty much every day in my practice. The lips come forward because, like the camera lens, the aperture is going to get smaller. There's no doubt about that. It has to. It's like an elephant's comb, all right? What happens when the lips are small? That's the area. Yes! Bonus point. Why? The pressure behind the lips is getting bigger because of the smaller opening and therefore the speed of the air, the smaller channel, is going to be faster. What is speed of air control on the flute? Pitch. What is quantity of air control on the flute? Volume. Volume. Have you read my book? I actually do have it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally a whole chapter on this and it bold. It's like volume equals this pitch. Equals. Yes, there you go. This is so important. So if you're dropping down at the end of the note, what is actually happening? The pitch is changing. The pitch is going lower. We have to control the pitch. So it doesn't go lower. How do we do that? We speed up the air. How do we speed up the air? We make a smaller space. How do we make a smaller space? Thank you. We bring the lips forward. There is no guesswork in playing the flute. It's just we're taught that there's guesswork. There really isn't. I'm not a scientist by any means, but I didn't understand any of this stuff till I was in my late twenties. And then I really thought about it. I was like, why do I need to do that? Why is this not working? And there's always an answer. So when that's dropping, as soon as you feel it dropping. You think, okay, air's too slow, do something to create faster air, and you'll drop your finger and the lips forward. Do it again. By the way, when you bring the lips forward, there's one other thing that's affected, which is angle of airspeed. So the angle's going to get flying high, so you're going to have to work hard to bring the lips forward, but also control the angle of air. Good, again, even slower on the to support from your tummy to get speed. We've all heard the word support. Yeah? What is it? What actually is support? Nobody. Literally, nobody has a clue. I'm going to show you what support is. My bottle of water. Okay. Now, from your belly button. Oh, by the way, the diaphragm has absolutely nothing to do with support. Nothing to do with flip playing whatsoever. I just can't believe that we're even talking about this in the, you know, 2023, people actually have the audacity to say diaphragm, blows my mind, because we know it's not true. We know it's an absolute myth and a lie. The diaphragm has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with playing a musical instrument. Nothing at all. And anyone who says otherwise is literally lying to you in your face, and probably knows so as well. I'm going to get fired for saying that on live streaming. Um, anyway, what you do have is from your belly button, bring all the way around to the small of your back is your intercostal muscles. These are the muscles that are between your ribs, and they go right the way around. So imagine that this bottle of water is me, or you. This is my head, or like the opening of my throat, and this is my, my bum. Do you say bum in the US? Yeah, okay. Anus. <laughs> 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 anyway, so the, my hand is my intercostal muscle. Okay, so right now there's no pressure, just like now, I'm just standing. Now the water is the air in my lungs. Okay, so what happens when I tense or put some pressure on from my intercostal muscle? water, the air is moving. Okay? Now what happens if I take my hands and I go bang? The water is going to go at 100 miles an hour. Okay? So the more intensity I give it from my intercostal muscles, the more speed the air is going to have. And I can prove it to you. Sorry. Where's my book? My book. Oh, here. <laughs> um, so if I take any note, C, and I just do something crazy from here. Something whipping in my intercostal muscles. What's happening to the sound? What's happening to the sound? Kevin, can you force that? I need it in simpler terms than that. Listen, one thing's changing. Begins with P, ends with pitch. <laughs> the pitch changes. The pitch is changing, right? What's happening to the pitch? Going higher. What do we know controls pitch? 
You told us. Speed. speed of air. So if the pitch is going higher, the air speed is getting faster. So my intercostal muscles are controlling the speed of air. I know. Crazy, right? But it's true, as that is support, that is literally support. If you apply a little bit of pressure, it's going to squeeze the bottle of water, it's going to get some more air speed. Now, why is that important? Because when Kevin is trying to do things like it's dropping in pitch. So we need to do it. So one thing we can do is to make a smaller space with the camera lens of the lips. But the second thing we can do is to use our tummy muscles, our intercostal muscles. And it will never drop in pitch. It will, the, the rest is up to the lips to control the, the movement. Does that make any sense yes. at all? But I don't care about all that. I care about this. This is your takeaway. If you can do that, you're flying. Now, how are you going to do it? This is not the way to do it. How would it what is the way to do it? Yeah, maybe. I think very, very slow technical work. Tapping on the roller would be the go to. You know, exercise one, exercise three, exercise four, exercise five, exercise ten. You know, tapping on the roller. Everyone knows Tap on Zobar. I've been using this for years since I graduated as an undergrad, which was in 2006. I came back to PG about three years ago. Love it. What a great book that was. I don't understand why it's called Tap on Zobar, because you know Tap on was already dead when it was written. Gobert and this other guy called Louis Fleury. I actually just finished my doctorate. I came to do a year and a half study to finish my doctorate. Don't do a doctorate. <laughs> it's really not fun. <laughs> but um, I wrote my whole dissertation all about French stuff, so this is why I learned this story. But Louis Fleury, who's another very famous flute player and student of Tafnell's, got together with Gobert, who was also a student of Tafnell's, and they compiled all the exercises. Tafnell was already dead. So it should really be called Tafnell, Gobert, and Fleury, but it's not. I don't know why. So anyway, that's a completely nothing to do with what we're talking about. But I would take one exercise one, which is just the five note finger exercise. Play it nice and slowly. Number three is the most neglected scale exercise in the book. Absolutely love it. It takes care of itself. Just look at it. It's a great one. Number four is the famous one. Number five is chromatic. And number ten is diminished sevenths. If you do all of them, you don't have to do them all in this case, but with the thumb behind you, that will just totally sort it for you. You will, you will never even think about it ever again. So that is actually the answer to a lot of, that sounds awful, a lot of issues in your playing. There aren't many issues in your playing, but the thumb is controlling much more to do with the sound than actually the finger. I really believe that. Does that make sense? Yes. Are you going to walk out of the room and cry? Okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thanks for playing. Thank for you. Okay. Tell us about yourself. My there used to be Brian. this TV show, by the way. Did you guys get this TV show in the US called Blind Date? Uh, not to my knowledge. Does anyone know Blind Date? This is a TV show in the UK, and there was a TV host called Silla Black. She said, I bet she's really famous. She had a funny accent. And there was a screen, and on one side of the screen there was a single person. And on the other side of the screen there were three single people, and the, the single person on their own had to ask questions to the three, and then she got to choose who or he or she is going on a date with. It was called the dating game. Okay, the dating game. But it was before all. And the catchphrase, all the catchphrase, um, that the host would say is, who, uh, what's your name? Where'd you come from? So that's a, that's a very long story to get there. But that's why I feel like whenever I say that. What's your name and where'd you come from? My name's Brian Culler. I actually am from Charlotte. Um, I'm kind of in between my undergrad and my master's, and I'm going to play the Mozart G concerto first movement. Um, not the second end, actually. Definitely not that one. The exposition. Where did you do your undergrad? Uh, App State in Boone, North Carolina. Appalachian? Appalachian? Apple, yeah, it's not Appalachian, by the way. It's Appalachian. It is Appalachian. Someone picked me up on the, on the day. That's why I corrected myself. I only know it because of Appalachian Spring. You know the piece mm -hmm. that you need to buy Oh, yes. Lovely. Do you say Appalachian Spring? Appalachian. Yeah, Appalachian Spring. No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the British mind is just being blown. I convinced someone yesterday that, because they asked me, do you say schedule instead of schedule? And I was like, yeah, of course we do. CH makes a sh word. They're like, wow, that's crazy. And I was like, I've never understood why you guys all say school instead of show. And he was like, you really say that? And I was like, yeah. Like, <laughs> we did not say that, but I haven't told him the truth yet. So anyway, I know it's Appalachian. Appalachian. And where do you want to do your master's? Uh, I don't know yet. Undecided. Yeah. Cool. OK, let's Mozart. Do I have to share the story with the Mozart? Yes. <laughs> this is a great story about the Mozart concert. You know it? No. <laughs> you know who he, was, who he commissioned these pieces? Uh, I know that he doesn't like the flute and he likes the oboe more. Well, mm, <laughs> depends how you interpret a particular letter. There's a guy called Ferdinand de Jong who's a Dutch 
very amateur flute player. He actually was a boss of a company called the, the East India Dutch Trading Company or something, which imported tea uh, from the West Indies. Anyway, gosh, I'm such a geek, don't I know these things? Probably, <laughs> this is what happens when you do a dog trip, honestly. Don't do it, don't do it. It does not make you a good person. But um, he was rich and he commissioned Mozart to write, I think it was four concertos and four sets of quartets. But remember, the flute back then was nothing like the flute we have now. It was quiet, it was totally out of tune, it was very difficult to play, no one was very good at it. And so Mozart was frustrated, especially by Dijon, because he was not a good flute player at all. So he couldn't be bothered writing all the stuff. So he took the concerto that he'd written a year earlier for the oboe in the key of C major, and he just popped it up into D major. He wrote the G major already, which is the one people hear now. And then he resold the oboe concerto in the key of C major. When Dijon found out, he cancelled the rest of the commission, which is why we only have two flute concertos and only one set of quartet. Mm. So there you go. Now you know the story and you can tell it. Yeah. There's actually very little opportunity to tell this story because when there's an orchestra standing behind you, you can't really get to do it. Uh, I actually have a huge issue with playing concertos in recitals, which is maybe something we should talk about some I think it's bad programming. Um, and I think in America, you guys are, sorry, that's very brutal. America in general is constantly programming recitals with concertos, and I think it's crazy. You would never go to Carnegie Hall and play a recital with a concerto in it. So why are universities allowing it? my question. The argument is, well, there's no other opportunities to play concertos. I disagree. If the student is not finding other opportunities to play concertos, that's their fault. Because when I was at college, there's tons of competitions, tons of concerto competitions, tons of master classes. If someone isn't signing up for anything, that's their problem. But if they take advantage of the opportunities available, there's loads of opportunities for concertos to be played. I don't think a recital that goes towards your degree is appropriate. And that would be something my, my new students at Northwestern State will have to deal with, because I don't know about it. I also don't want single movements being played. If you can't time your program to be correct, that's bad programming. And programming is a skill that needs to be taught and learned. So I'm sorry. We're starting years with a very negative note. I'm not saying we should <laughs> This is the perfect time to play concerto. It's a master class. <laughs> this is the perfect time. But I think you can do what you like. But for me, when I sit there and I see people playing concerto, I've seen doctoral students doing it, and I just roll my eyes inside and think, these people should know better, and these teachers should know better as well. I can say this now that I've graduated. So, with that lovely positive note, let's hear the most fun. Actually, as a community of flute players, tend to think of this as an audition piece. I am starting this teaching position having had 15 years of playing full time. I don't think I took very many auditions, and I used to have to play this all the time. Actually, the G major concerto almost more than the G. I think I played the G major five times in my life as an orchestra. The G major I was doing like 50 cents a year at one point because there's no flutes in the orchestra, so it's cheaper higher. That's not a joke. That's why the G major costs a bit more. There's two flutes. 
need to make all these sensor small movements, so our approach has gone with a for it because we compare it with one of the early motor track symphonies or a Haydn symphony that doesn't have any flutes in it, so they're not going to hire any good flute players. This is a whole other conversation. But that's why you rarely actually get flutes to do a G major concerto. But to play it with an orchestra behind me, will you ever have the opportunity? Is there anything? Are you preparing for anything like that? No. No, no. I mean, they're hard to get. I know it's pitched at college level. But it's an amazingly fun experience. These are not the hardest pieces in the world. Sure, we have to take care of them and we have to control a lot of things. But see, to play them with an orchestra behind you is literally one of the greatest joys you will ever have in your life, if you're allowed it to be, and you don't get too stressed about the whole thing. But you have to approach it from a slightly different perspective, because sure, when you're taking a musician, and I have been on both sides of that, where I'm playing a musician also sitting on the panel, I'm listening for certain things. Are they playing in time? Are they playing good rhythm? Are they playing with good intonation? Are they making good musical decisions? Are they controlling the trills? Are they playing elegantly? This is very much um, towards the top of my list of Mozart. And certain certain um, numbers of those rules I will take into real life concerts as well. Of course, all of them, but in different ratios as such. Um, and the elegance factor goes straight to the top in concert situations. So can we find a way to give it musical shape, which you're doing perfectly, but without doing it by force, and actually just to do it a bit more a tasteful thing from here? This is something we do not talk enough about, in my opinion. Somebody talks about it. Also, this is so hard to do three days ago. You're a lot taller than me. And I actually spent about 10 years only playing from memory, so I feel slightly uncomfortable playing with the music stand. I'm really trying to get myself back into the habit of it, and over the last year I've played a lot more with it. What I've found is to put it a little lower and a little flatter allows you to see it clear. Do you know what I mean? Because you can just look you You have glasses. I used to wear glasses when I got LASIK, because I couldn't, and the reason I got it, I kid you not, because in the orchestra I could see the conductor over the river my glasses half the time. So you might have to be slightly standing in a slightly different place, but try it. Just, can you see that? I, I can't see the bottom of the whole thing. Yeah. But then also you can take a step back or yeah, a little further away. Or adjust it what way you need. But also I, if you if you're not playing this from memory, you're not going to pass through the first round. Uh, through if it's a an American you're screen. So you like play it from memory. Most are not played from memory. I'm sorry to be angry and grumpy about this. That's yeah. terrible. There's gonna be so many people watching screen. That's not true. I passed through the first round and I played it with music. Fine, I'm just kind of speaking in metaphors. But like if you're gonna play in a concert. Flute players are terrible for this. Wind players are terrible for this. If you go watch a piano concerto, they do not bring the music out. If you go watch a violin concerto, they do not bring the music out. If you go watch a cello concerto, they do not bring the music out. If you go watch a flute concerto, they absolutely bring the music out. Like, we are so scared of playing from memory, and the only way we get good at playing from memory is to practice playing from memory. Yeah. So do you want me to not look at it, or do you want me to look at it? Do you know it from memory? I, maybe the beginning, probably. Okay. I just played it enough time. <laughs> Um, and also, I'm one of these people that's like, we do this or we don't do it. I don't believe in having half a stand or half a side just in case. I also don't believe in having one piece in the concert that's memorized and everything else we play through music. So we come out and we play all these pieces with the stand and then we get to our party trick moment. It's <laughs> <laughs> so tacky and that diminishes the power of playing from, playing from memory and, and what we, the responsibility we have as musicians. All or nothing. The teachers are going to be screaming in their offices when I said, but I really believe that. And I, I, I apologize if this sounds arrogant, but I did it for real. I did it for real for many years. People paid me to do it. And if you turn up at Carnegie Hall and you play in one of these concerts where lots of people play, and you're the only one that doesn't, do you know what I mean? Or you get booked by the whatever symphony orchestra to play Mozart, and you don't do it, you're not coming back. Like, it's that simple. I won't, I won't work for you. Yeah? So that's the truth, that is the truth. If you're gonna play this in college, or you're gonna play it in studio class, or you're gonna play it in a, in a screen edition, fine, do what you want. But the real world is gonna require more work. And I think you're absolutely capable of doing that. I would never ask you to do it otherwise. So let's see what happens. I'm not expecting to take you. Great, okay, so we've lost our big bang at the top, which I love, but now it's a little bland. <laughs> okay, yeah. Also, you're, you're not standing in a very committed way. Go for it. Yeah. Brian, the breath that you take in at the beginning is going to control everything that comes after it. So if you want to sound like this, that's what it's going to sound like. But if you want to sound like... You'll get that, yeah? The breath is part of the sound. Sorry, I might blast you right in your ear. <laughs> you see what I'm doing? You're kind of bumping. 
something at the bottom.
Now, now, Brian, it's getting better every time, but we've still got work to do in this. It needs a little more support, and it need, I still need more commitment. It's just like, mm, da, 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 yum, bum, ba, dum, bum. the king is arriving into the room, or something like that. That's what I hear. <laughs> yeah. Imagine he walks in and everyone's like, mm, they'll get beheaded. <laughs> yum, yum, bum, ba, dum, da, wah, 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 yum, bum, ba, dum. Good. Now, yes. Great. So much better. I don't like to see. Can I have a bit more energy without, without banging it? I can try. Yeah, you, no, you, you will do. Come on. <laughs> I believe in you. I believe in you. I might blow up in the camera. Yes. Now vibrate on the C and we are there. I don't like to talk too much about the brasso because I think it becomes too artificial. Do you mean like at the start of the sea or just throughout the sea? Oh man, I'm not clever enough to answer that. <laughs> just whatever sounds good. <laughs> Be ruled by what sounds good. That is the answer to everything. So rather than... We want... Stand a little more grounded as well. Don't be afraid of. So I've left the floor, I write the little back, and then I am ready to tackle them. Yeah. Yes, so much better. Please don't move your body. I'm going to move your foot a little bit. I don't know. The same thing? Yeah. Uh, why is it not got the commitment? It should be like a circus here. It should be wild. You should be so over the top. But they don't hear that. They'll hear the full 100% there. So that means your lights are louder, your quiet are quieter, your shorts are shorter, your commuters are more commuto, your phrases are more more extreme. If you don't do that, you're such an average musician. And you're way beyond that. So be average. Be beyond that.
<laughs> you know, I love America. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> but can I just say, I don't know why you all hate Olive Garden so much. I love it. <laughs> I can sit in salad at Olive Garden for like 12 bucks or whatever. It's amazing. Pasta, on the other hand, is atrocious. And I don't want you serving Olive Garden pasta. Soup and salads I can take, but not Olive Garden pasta. It has to be pasta from my favorite Italian restaurant. You have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? No, I don't think so. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it just has to be that you're doing all the right things, but sometimes it's like smacking me in the face and it just, it doesn't sound like Mozart, it sounds like Shostakovich. Yeah, it's your accent. Yeah. But I know that's a problem I'm working on. Right so, how are you going to work on it? Um, playing it slower, singing it. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely that. playing it slower. I'm a real metronomer. Like, I put everything on the metronome. But what exercise could you come up with? By the way, when we're talking about Tafnil and Gober, I have two students that call Tafnil and Gober when they do this in my lessons. Tafnil and Stober because I constantly change the exercise to suit what we need it for. And I really believe in doing this. Do not be afraid of forming your own exercise. So you could take an exercise based on bam, 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 bam. You could do this. Sure, there's tons and tons of books, but you've got to really think about what you're doing and what it sounds like. I'm sorry, we didn't talk huge amounts about Mozart. I would be banging, no pun intended, the metronome on, putting the metronome at slow tempo, about 80, and going yum, bum, ba dum, bum, dee, yum, bum, 
and making it as expressive and as musical as possible without any of these funny accents or anything. If you can do it at the slow tempo, you'll do it at the fast tempo. You have lots of great things. You just need to be a little more, how do I put this into English? You need to take responsibility a little more for the things that need working on. Every single person in the world, from James Galway to Manny to the right down, to people starting right at the beginning of their flute playing journey, they all have things they need to work on and continue to work on. Galway practices like a trooper. Like, I've never met anyone who practices as much as this in my life. Like, and he's always looking, and he would come into class at like 75 years old and go, I was really thinking about my breathing, and I figured it out. <laughs> I mean, there's this story that um, his wife, Lady Jeannie, told me once about they had come back from tour, and like a really busy tour day, and he immediately went to practice. That's what he does. And she was cooking. And she's like, Jenny, dinner. And he just, he was just practicing and ignored her. And she's like, Jenny, dinner. And eventually the door opened. I'm practicing. And she's like, dinner's on the table. So he comes down and she's like, could you put the uh, bread on the table? And he picks up the bread and puts it on his head and then continues to practice. <laughs> and he never stopped practicing. Don't think that it comes easy to these people. They sound so great and can do amazing things because they practice not just the most, but the most intelligently. And they sort the issues. You need to do this. Sort the issues and you will soar. Thank you. Oh, I love this piece. I haven't heard this in ages. I'm sorry, you haven't sat there so long. You can play a few notes if you want. Do you want to play a few notes and I'll just talk and hide your playing a few notes? Are you sure? Yeah, okay, you play me on score. Anyone have any questions at this stage? You don't have to have questions, but anyone know anything? Am I making sense? Yes. How do you use, um, do you always use pop? No, I absolutely do not always use it. But I use it at the appropriate moment. It's never going to give you as hard an attack, but it's going to give you a clean attack if you practice it. The problem is people will take pa, and it's not clean at first. So go on, play, just play, 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 ignore me. So it's kind of like, you know, it's unfocused. But the more you practice it, the more clean you can get. And the reason I like it is because it's so precise with the air. I actually have a little exercise I practice every day, and I just take three little studies. I have bone number six, bone caprice number six, Raikar and the little ending of Gossip Tambaran. Do you know? Um, da, 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 da. And I just go through it on pair once a day, so I'll go. We should have the greatest arsenal of tools available to us all. You know, we should have a million articulations and a million fingers and a million ways of doing something. The more tools you have available to you, the more selective you can be in the moment to find what works best. The fewer tools you have available to you, the harder work it's going to be at the end of the day. So that's my feeling. Have as many 
as many resources available, and by resources I mean technique, you know. Hello. Hi. Tell us about yourself. Um, my name is Iman. I'm in, well, I'm going to ninth grade. I just finished eighth grade. So how old are you? Um, I don't know what that means, ninth grade. I'm, I'm 13 right now. Just a baby. Okay. <laughs> and I've been playing flute since I was four or five. Wow. What are you playing for? I'm playing Adele by Benjamin Goddard, even though it says... Oh, yeah, I said song song. Um, tell us the story of the Goddard suite. I'm joking, there's no story. <laughs> I don't know any story either. <laughs> I'm just joking. It's going to say a story. Cool. So, you, do you know the whole suite? Have you, have you done the other movement? No. No. So this is the middle of the three movements. The waltz is probably the most famous. Really tricky as well. Cool, I'm excited to hear this. We probably won't go the whole way through it because time is ticking, so mm -hmm. don't be offended when I stop you. just play the harmonic. So play the real note and then switch between, like this. Already sounds better. Can you sing and play at the same time? Have you ever done this? Yeah. Yeah? So I want to add a 
entire stage. So we're going to play real note, harmonic, singing, and playing. So it'll go like this. And it does not match for what you sing, by the way. Like, I can't even pitch it. It doesn't matter. Just by getting the voice activated. Just Can you sing falsetto up there in Park Center? Just try, yeah, and you have to be like, oh, who cares about them? They're not going to. If you don't have hard to play the laugh, if you just go for it, they'll believe everything you do. That's one thing I have learned doing this crazy thing. Ooh, it's going to be live. It's going to be kind of aggressive with the voice. Yes, again, again, fantastic, again, and lots of air, lots of air, again. Good, harmonic, second play, do it on an F this time, just for fun. And harmonic, you're just going to fit the middle finger time. Yep, so real F, harmonic, sing. Yeah, it needs more air than that, so we're going to get... If I lean this against this wall, I'll try my very best not to make a mark. Thank you. So I want you to put your feet together. And you see how I'm leaning forward? You want to see? So I'm leaning forward to keep this in balance, but I'll pull back if it's going to mm -hmm. fall. Yeah? So I'm going to do this. And then when I breathe, and because I'm going to support properly, my belly is going to expand. So it will come out, which means I should straighten up without the feet fall. Make sense? So watch. Okay, so I'm going to play.
I ran a marathon, right? I just wanted to do it once in my life. When I was turning 30, I had this list of 30 things I wanted to do. Some of them musical, not very many of them musical. Most things were just like crazy things on travel when I was touring and stuff. But I had 30 things to do. One thing I wanted to do was run a marathon. I didn't want to do it twice, just once. That was it. And I spent a year training for a marathon. It was horrible. Absolutely the most miserable thing I've ever done in my entire life. But I'm really glad I did it. And right towards the end of my training, you know, you're building your distance up and up and up and up. You start like half a mile and you go to two miles and then you go to three miles. Eventually you're running like 22 miles a day or something. Absolutely miserable. And marathon's 27 minutes, I think, if I remember right. Anyways, I met all these other runners. And they, right before the race, like a week or two before the actual marathon, they would do this crazy thing. They would take a backpack, like a special runner's backpack that had like water bottle things and all this. But they would fill it with weights and then they would go and run and run and run with their weights on. And then it would come to marathon day, and they would take off their weights, and they would fly, because they were no longer weighed down. This is a harmonic, in my mind. It's adding in weight, it's resistance. If you can play the note, if you, I mean, if you're practicing it my way, rather than this way, I'm not saying it's better, it's just how I practice it. If, if you can add the weight, and you can get really good at playing it with the resistance, what happens when you remove it? You fly, okay? So, this is why I'm having you doing things like this. There's the really. I mean, there's no doubt that it got better, no doubt. And then you add the third stage of the voice. What does the singing and playing do? Well, it resonates your body, opens your chest, opens your throat, it, it kind of opens your mind a little bit to the sound you're trying to create, and it gets all the harmonic structure in place as well. So we add in the third stage, and your sound should get better and better every time. And then figure out some harmonics. 
and this thing can play. your total spectrum of sound. So I want you to go away and do this and, and think about how the harmonics are going to help you. And there's no better place to do it than on some upper notes. You know, so there's a little bit in measure three where it goes up the top E. Everyone's going to miss it. So we play it as a harmonic. are there for us to use is our it's our runner's backpack um, I think building them up stacking them it, can, it allows us to control the airspeed and it allows us to control our lips but the reality of how do we use them within the music we're playing is I think a different way to practice them so that's something to think about um, again there would be I tend to think how many teachers screaming at their computer screen right now I, I don't find the stacking of them actually massively useful and I know that's not what the book tells us and I know that's not what our teachers tell us but I have done it and I've done it over and over again and I've, I've just never found that much reward. But to take the harmonic and to add it as resistance into something that's already problematic in terms of the control of the sound, that's where it became useful for me. So I'm not saying don't practice it your way, absolutely do. But there's other ways to practice it as well. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to be a kind of intelligent practicer here and you're going to have to think, okay, that bit doesn't sound as good as I wanted to or that bit doesn't sound as good as I wanted to or that whatever bit. How can I make the sound better? And one of the ways you can do that immediately is harmonics. Mm -hmm. Let's do their exercise. So have you done this before, stacking the harmonic? Okay, so playing a low C. Great, the best low C you've ever played in your life though. Walk it down from a D, like this. Maintain the low C and then increase the speed of the air and pop it up one, it'll go up one octave. Ah, that's smooth. Don't bang it out smoothly and control it. Yeah, fantastic. Now let's go three. So I think it's a fifth is the next one. I know there's a series that I should know, but I can't remember it. Great, giving all four of them, nice and slow, no tongue, and no bumps as you move, nice and smooth between the, the changes. Yes, and you can go to the next one if you want to grow it again again. Okay, sorry, I'm just figuring out the next in the series, excuse me. Yeah, keep going, let's go from the low C all the way up. Ah, did you hear that? you can do it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm going to be so embarrassed if it doesn't work. But it's because I have just been playing and I'm not really in shape having just spoken for an hour. But if you finger at top G and then do a C minor arpeggio, you can get it all to sound a top, D, a top G to control the harmonic. If that makes any sense at all. So C minor arpeggio. <laughs> Top G. Top G. 
Yeah, G for gorilla. There, there it is. So you can get that. Once you've got that, you can then add the next one, the next one. That, for me, is like the ultimate I'm doing support harmonics correct, if you can do this. And actually, you can do it a half step higher as well on the G-sharp. It's typical cool. Um, there's something I was going to say to you. I forget. That, for me, is going to change your control and your sound of the flip, is really introducing harmonics in that way, you know? Stacking of time. Everyone does it. I probably should do more of it. I, I just don't find it useful in that way. But to fit it as a comparison to the real world, if that makes sense, is where it gets exciting to me. Does that make any sense to everybody what I'm kind of explaining and how to use them in that way? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So you can take things like De La Sonority, the number one most played exercise in the universe. You know where these people go? You know that one? Yeah. We, I had a third stage, so I'll go. I just know the whole series now. And actually, the other massive advantage to this is even if you're playing with other people, sometimes the harmonic here and there is very helpful in terms of intonation and color. So, Learn your harmonic series, learn what fingerings and the low notes overblown give you the pitch in other places, and then just introduce them to the piece and really listen to the sound you're making. Because you can play the flip, no problem. I just really want to open and refine the sound with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Will you take away and practice that a little bit? But this is again a case of, you know, Tapanel and Bavamber, you know, like you're going to invent your own exercise for this. There isn't anything written down. Sure, I actually do have an exercise written down for it, but I'm not telling you to practice it because it's actually the most simply written exercise in the world. Let me find you the whole one. Oh, I can't remember what chapter is. Oh, there we go. Oh, well, support is chapter seven. Don't do it support, look at that. Control. Is it control? Yeah, control. It's going to teach you all about the harmonics. Also, power and projection, chapter two, is pretty much what we just done. If I complete this. Oh, it's just a good book. I haven't seen this in so long. <laughs> I must buy a copy for the least thing. Uh, people keep stealing my copies. They're really annoying. See, look, here. So you've got to play the real note, the low C fingerings get harmonic, and then you add in the voice. And then you just go up and up and up every time each time. All the way to G, low G, add in the voice. That's it. And um, when do you use this? Well, here you go. Here's two examples of Frank Sinatra and Brahms 1. To get the power. I don't know if you've ever played Brahms 1. That big solo with the fourth movement, you have to the living daylight side of it because the French horn's going to cover you. So this is why we practice these things. Often in flute lessons and flute classes, people say you're blowing too hard, you're not playing loud enough. See, in real world, you've got to play damn loud sometimes. Really, really loud. Especially in a recital or a concerto situation. So it is absolutely a skill that we need to practice to develop this big, big, rich sound. Of course, the complete extreme opposite playing P and P, 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 and not being out of tune and not being out of color and out of focus is equally as important. But don't neglect the live playing as well. And the, the, it's not even about live, it's about, it's about color and it's about beauty, essentially, making a big, beautiful sound. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bavar. Thank you for playing. <laughs>
there's a thousand dollar machine to manipulate. Every note that the lips have to manipulate into a position to get the best note in terms of pitch and in terms of color and in terms of register and in terms of volume and everything. And of course, when the pitch, the color, the volume changes and you go from one note to the next and so on, the position has to change as well. There's like two and a half million embouchures on the flute. And if you watch the great players play, they're moving like crazy to adjust for things. So this fits the stuff. You don't, like, you don't have to move the lips that much. I just really disagree with this. So when it comes to the low register, it's really for me about behind my teeth and about getting the space there. So, like I did with the band, you can walk it down from a low B. So we'll do this. So we'll go. Now that's a low C. I can actually continue to crescendo through that. It won't split until I get to the point where I cannot expand my face anymore. So it's actually you're limited by the shape of your head here to some extent. As I'm putting more air into the flute, I have to keep the airspeed slow. How do I, or slack, should I say slower, because it's a low feet, slow, low notes mean slow air. So how do we do that? Well, the bigger the space I can create, the less pressure behind the slower the air. So I'm literally going to go, and then I'll get to the point where I cannot stretch my face anymore, and then either I stay there or the note will pop up if I go further. Does that make sense? Sure is actually really in the middle. I have a friend, Perry, in Spain who makes these lip plates with a slightly askew embouchure cut. And he sent a couple to me to try. It's incredible. I never realized my embouchure is not central until he sent it to me. And I wish I could have it. Like it was such a great head joint. Um, but it's worth understanding. What, I'm not saying change or anything in your embouchure, but understand where, where it's going. Yeah. And if it, you can change it. Um, but I would just do a little exercise of like. Yeah, I love that one. 
that's going to cover all your registers. Okay. I did that. I assume you cared when I was saying that. That's part of my mm -hmm. good battle That's part of my perf warm up. Wow, we've spoken a lot about perf in this class. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of class on perf. Anyway, thank you for your question. I hope some things were useful. Please, um, as I say, take what you like and discard the rest. I am. Um, Sure. I thought you were telling the time zone. No, I uh, wasn't sure. We're still doing questions. No, but there are some people that want to see your thumb position when you were talking about the thumb sure. and seeing that example. And is this, this cam which camera am I looking at? This one. So, oh, this is the most awkward one. So, <laughs> what I'm saying, tell me if this is in the, the screen. Um, lower a little bit. Perfect. Okay, so a lot of people's thumbs will come underneath the flute. Unfortunately, this will give you this motion, which means you have to compensate balancing it somewhere else, usually in the left hand. What I was taught and really like is the thumb comes back about there. It's not touching the metal work, but it's, for me, it's under the F key, but it doesn't have to be, because depending on the size of your hands. But it's behind the tube. Now, there's two reasons I like that. Reason number one is it gives me this forward motion, um, which is exactly the balance we need in the flute. There is a balance there. It's even balancing in my hand without me putting any fingers down. But secondly, it gives me this curve on my hand so that my pinky can be flexible and free, and my fingers can stay close to the keys when I have no problems. Um, I mean, if you just go watch YouTube videos of Galway's the obvious one, because he has a lot of them, even when he's talking about things like this, I'm sure, you know, watch them and look how they play and copy copy who your heroes are and you'll you'll make progress. That's what I did. I spent hours trying to find my like James Galway. And then he spent hours trying to find like a Michael Bridges. And now I just want to spend hours trying to find like a better version of me. You know, you become a point where you're like, okay, I can't do, I can't be as good a James Galway as James Galway is. He told me actually, well, he's told lots of us, for him, his hero was Marcel Moyes. And he spent hours trying to copy Moyes and trying to sound like him. And then he realized, you know, it's okay being James Galway, so he now <laughs> sounds like him. But it's true, we, you know, like even when I teach, well, when I was an undergrad, I was taught by a guy called David Nicholson, he's no longer with us. David was for many years the first flute of the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, unbelievably experienced player. Has studied with Jeffrey Gilbert. If you don't know who that is, you should go read about Jeffrey Gilbert, very important man in our world. Um, and then he went to Paris and studied with Moyes and um, Rampa. And none of David's students sounded like him. He had this very unique, crystal clear sound. I've never kind of heard anything like it. And I always wanted to sound like him, but he never tried to make me sound like him. We all, all his students, we all just sounded like ourselves. And his goal, I realized, was just to make us sound like a better version of ourselves. And I really try hard to do that in my own teaching. I don't want my students to sound like me. I want them to sound way better than me. You know, that's my goal. Um, so, yeah, go look at your heroes really the answer to these things and I, I, I don't believe in saying there's only one way to do things but I do think that thumb I can't find a better way of doing it you know when we're talking about articulation and pen sound production a thousand ways to do things and a lot of it is ruled by physical stuff but also your your face you know like your concepts of sound and what you like but this right hand thumb I really struggle to find a reason not to do it and a lot of the time I'm looking for a reason not to do it there's one or two flute players that spring to mind, I'm not going to mention them, that play fantastically and their thumb is really not in that position. So be it. I'm not superhuman, and most of my students aren't superhuman. I want them to have the best chance. So this is really a, a good thing to work on. I really re recommend everyone does it. I hope that answers that question. I mean, there's no magic to it. It's just about changing the directional force from underneath to behind and forward, pushing forward. Thank you. Good question. So thanks guys and ladies, I appreciate everyone's time here. I'll be here for a little bit, I want to try some pickles. Um, <laughs> if anyone wants to ask me anything, feel free to do it privately. Thank you guys for playing, big round of applause for Thank you, just <laughs>